Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar, Efficient Data Mining for Personalized Medicine. Biotech guru G. Stephen Burrell has said that the future of healthcare lies in personalized medicine, which, according to Burrell, has changed the way doctors think about disease. Rather than viewing disease in terms of its symptoms, personalized medicine approaches disease based on the underlying molecular mechanism driving the disease. Understanding such molecular mechanisms involves sifting through and studying lots and lots of data. Today's webinar has been designed to help you accomplish this task by discussing the TransSmart Knowledge Management Platform. Our three panelists are experts in mining data for personalized medicine applications, so let's meet them. Dr. Brian Athey is co-CEO of the TransSmart Foundation and a professor at the University of Michigan Medical School. Brian is going to provide details on the TransSmart platform and demonstrate the role it plays in data mining for personalized medicine applications. Dr. Siraman Ocharowin is Manager, Translational Medicine, Life Sciences Professional Services at Thomson Reuters. Siraman will illustrate and discuss additional examples of the use of TransSmart for tackling big data for personalized medicine studies. Dr. Stephen Larson is Chief Information Officer for the nonprofit organization One Mind for Research. Stephen will make the case that TransSmart incentivizes data sharing and encourages collaborative data analysis. John Sterling, Editor-in-Chief of GEN, will serve as your moderator. Please feel free to enlarge the slide images or download the complete presentation. At any time during the webinar, you can send in a question for our panelists. Type your question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hit Submit. The panel will try to answer as many as possible during the question and answer segment that takes place after all the presentations have been made. So, if everyone's ready, let's get going. Dr. Brian Athey will be our lead-off presenter. Brian? Thank you. The title of my talk is, What is the Status Quo and Future of the TransMart Landscape? I'll tell you about the formation of something called the TransMart Foundation, its visibility, uh, the collaborative work that we're doing across the world with TransMart, and its uh, promise to help uh, biomedical research using big data and ultimately to help with uh, personalized medicine. I'm the Michael Savageau Professor and Chairman of the Department of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics at the University of Michigan Medical School. Um, TransMart is a system that's reaching a lot of visibility right now. It's a fluid time, it's an exciting time, and it's a somewhat dangerous time because we've got folks using TransMart in the United States, in Europe, in Japan. It's spreading everywhere, and the visibility is high. Last week, I was honored to represent the TransMart Foundation at the White House at the uh, Open Science Champions event that was held last Thursday, and uh, there's no question that we're hitting the radar screen internationally. The visibility is high. We presented a poster on TransMart at the Indian Treaty Room, only one of 12 posters uh, selected for that event. It's exciting time. The TransMart Foundation, which was created earlier this year, has a vision and a mission statement and goals. The vision is that we're a global nonprofit organization which is devoted to realizing the promise of translational biomedical research, which means moving basic science in through clinical research and out into practice through the development of the TransMart knowledge base and knowledge management platform. And the mission of the foundation is that we are organizing a community so that we can uh, enable effective sharing, integration, standardization, and analysis of heterogeneous data from collaborative studies, from translational research by mobilizing the open source uh, TransMart platform, improving it over time, and doing that in a consistent way and mobilizing the open data community. The conceptual background of the TransMart idea and more generally of personalized medicine is showed in this slide that was taken from a, a recent report called Towards Precision Medicine, Building a Knowledge Network for Biomedical Research and a New Taxonomy of Diseases, which was published in 2012 by the National Academy of Science, Institute of Medicine. In the middle, you can see the uh, 
a hierarchical organization of different levels that would include the genome and the transcriptome, epigenome, proteome, metabolome, environmental cues, and all the other things that are linked together in some kind of hierarchical network. And that information brought together that way could, over time, create an informa- data and information commons that we could um, uh, tap into and uh, ultimately enable a knowledge network. On the left-hand side uh, is the side of biomedical research, uh, characterized by high-throughput technologies, uh, largely at this point, genomics, next-generation sequencing, epigenomics, looking at methylation, transcription, and the like, all the way up the stack to network and systems biology, which is enabling the new discoveries that are enabling uh, personalized medicine. On the right-hand side is the clinical research that comes from the clinics, involves clinical trials, clinical research, could go out into the community and look at comparative effectiveness. And the idea is that um, down at the bottom there, you have taxonomy, nomenclature, ontologies, all the kinds of things that could allow us to create a standardized capability to um, label data and information in terms of metadata, where it came from, uh, what is it used for, to allow us to aggregate the data of different types. Uh, Transmart really has three levels if you look at it. The top level is about the analytics. The middle level is about the platform itself, the Transmart platform. And the bottom level is about the different kinds of data types that are involved in Transmart. And they span from clinical data coming from electronic health records and clinical research management systems and other uh, reporting tools such as adverse events reporting tools. And in the middle is where the omics comes in, all the high throughput and high content uh, biomolecular data, including that data that's linked out to and into biorepositories. And then on the right, uh, it's reference data. It could, could include data from literature. It could co- include data from the National Institutes of Health or the Euro- European Biomedical Bioinformatics Institute or other sources, or data from um, proprietary sources such as Metacore, a system uh, provided by Thomson Reuters. Um, the uh, front end of the Transmart system, and a key component from the beginning, is the I2B2 capability. I2B2 stands for Integrating Bench to Bedside, and it's an open source uh, tool that was developed at Harvard University under the leadership of Zach Kahani and uh, John Murphy, two well-known professors in the field of clinical and biomedical informatics. Uh, the I2B2 um, project, which has been ongoing for nearly 10 years now, has been funded generously by the NIH National Centers for Biocomputing Initiative, NCBC. Um, I2B2 is largely focused on providing a search, data management, and analytic tool for um, elements of the record that are involving derivatives from electronic health record sources or clinical research management systems and allows for um, easy um, integration and analysis of that data and management of that data. And um, it's widely used in um, many academic health centers throughout the United States and now going into Europe. Um, The I2B2 capability has been modularized and is uh, providing service in and out of the Transmart um, code base and is being utilized to handle uh, the kind of data that uh, describes what you might call uh, the phenotype. This is a slide that shows the progression of the activities of interest and development of Transmart in Europe. Uh, there is an uh, initiative called the Innovative Medicines Initiative, IMI, which was uh, specified out in um, 2008 and has led to a um, funding stream of about euros. You can see this down on the bottom to support uh, clinical and translational research projects in Europe. And the Transmart platform was chosen to uh, uh, support those studies, some 30 studies. We'll see some of those uh, studies later in the, in the slide deck. Uh, and, uh, and the important thing is that there's significant funding in a project called ETRIX to continue the development of Transmart for those purposes. And this is one of several initiatives out in the world right now that is supporting this platform. Um, here's another look at the Transmart platform, and I think uh, later on in the talks that um, follow this talk, you can see some examples of its use. There's a collaboration platform. 
that brings people together and allows people to have secure and safe and secure access to the data that um, can be analyzed in the analytics environment that's down below. The key piece of the analytics environment is that it includes um, um, open source capabilities like the modules from R, or it includes uh, capabilities that are quasi-open source like the gene pattern coming out of Broad and the Magnet Center in New York City, or um, um, things uh, like Cytoscape, which are um, internationally um, uh, used uh, open source capabilities for network and systems analysis, or Spotfire, or Genco, or other proprietary systems. Down below is the Knowledge Hub, uh, and that is uh, the heart and soul of the Transmart Data Mart function. And uh, that brings together both proprietary, uh, study-specific resources for information and um, data and information and, and knowledge, as well as publicly available knowledge that's been accumulated. Um, the eTrix architecture is a bigger architecture than just Transmart. Uh, what you can see down in the blue down below there is the Transmart capability sitting on top of I2B2 and an extension of I2B2 that allows for the use of the Postgres uh, database capability, which is in the open source. And so the data mark and uh, some of the links out to the analytics are all in there. But you can see to make uh, a lot of projects work, you would have to wrap around other services into Transmart. So one of the things we're trying to do right now is figure out where the boundaries are. Where is Transmart in terms of its analytic collaborative platform and data uh, aggregation, integration, and sharing capabilities and other services, like uh, data management service, which could be a big feature in a company or a, a big academic center across the consortium, or ontology and standard services which aren't necessarily provided by the core of the Transmart platform, but interact uh, uh, closely with it. And so um, we're envisioning the um, evolution of Transmart to have um, clear and specific uh, application programmer interfaces to allow this kind of interactivity with Transmart to occur. And I think you'll see in the talks that precede this that this, um, this, uh, this kind of architecture uh, framework is already being utilized effectively. More of that will be developed over time. Uh, when, when we talk about uh, research, uh, biomedical research uh, involving big data or small data or um, ultimately the application in personalized medicine, the uh, data sharing aspects are important. There's been a lot of discussion about this and a lot of, um, frankly, in some ways, hand-wringing. It, it turns out that data sharing is a goal that um, we are all aspiring to, but uh, often falls short. And um, it's interesting that the United States government has just in, um, issued several executive orders coming from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy to um, require any federal agency that uh, funds more than $100 million worth of research to share the data effectively to the public in a machine-readable form. And those agencies, and NIH would be an example of that, or FDA, are going to have to con um, um, put plans forward to the White House, the OSTP, to do this um, by um, uh, September, um, October of this year. And so data sharing is going to grow in its importance, both at the individual and um, institutional and agency level. Uh, this is indicated by um, uh, the New York, a recent New York Times article uh, and uh, an announcement of a new global alliance to enable sharing or responsible sharing of genomic and clinical data, and Transmart Foundation has been talking to those folks. An initiative um, that's a joint initiative between the University of Chicago and the University of Michigan and the Open Cloud Consortium and the Transmart Foundation is uh, to help us with uh, establishing a, uh, an extension of the BioNimbus Protected Data Cloud to enable um, data sharing of many assets, including those from the TCGA. I think most folks, the Cancer Genomic Atlas, the TCGA knows how useful this is and how productive it has been, but getting at the data has been tough. We're working on ways to change the current practice of data sharing from TCGA, dbGaP, and other NCBI resources to simplify that dramatically uh, and uh, allow researchers to have access to that data in a safe and secure manner. 
Uh, you know, and a, a little diagram here is shown in the next slide, which shows the biomedical, the biologist, or ultimately the caregiver who's working with next-gen sequence data, reading out variants using Transmart there in the middle to do some of that work. Um, accessing and linking data out in either controlled access cloud, as described for TCGA, or more open access data, and ultimately uh, allowing uh, uh, move, movement of a sample through the uh, through the data measurement into a cloud aggregation and then analysis. Uh, and uh, the foundation will be making more announcements about that in the near future. And, you know, you can see all the kind of steps here in this slide that it involves different kinds of third-party open source software, and open source is a big key uh, that uh, interacts with data centers, interacts with permission and authorization and policies, and ultimately is um, overseen and governed by the appropriate bodies. And the Transmart Foundation is right in the middle of that. Uh, the Transmart Foundation goals are listed here, and the goals of our foundation are relatively simple and straightforward. Uh, we, uh, first of all, want to sustain and grow the platform so that it can continue to be used and not uh, diverge in its code base. Uh, we are about linking various groups, academic, not-for-profits, and corporate research communities together. This is a difficult but important challenge, and we're making some good headway here. And um, we're organizing the developer and the user communities around the use of Transmart in various ways. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And uh, ultimately, we're trying to reduce the barriers of, to use this advanced technology and create an ecosystem and an active marketplace. And so here are the kinds of uh, folks that uh, different um, classes of um, uh, agencies and, uh, you know, research uh, um, entities that are in interacting with us currently. And you can see that we span the gamut between industry, academics, and government agencies, including a number of commercial service providers that provide a value add to the use of Transmart, uh, going from installation to um, specialized use. Um, you, you, Transmart community and the Transmart Foundation follows the principles that um, have been set up by several open source communities like Mozilla or Apache or uh, Linux, and it involves open communication, open source licensing of the um, code and data that's used in the system, open tools, and a uh, frankly a um, trust in um, network, uh, trust in the um, uh, meritocracy of the. Um, developers and the users to organize themselves with uh, light top-down um, guidance and coordination to um, continue to develop the code base as Mozilla and Plone and all these others have done um, preceding us. Uh, and so um, there are several coordination functions that the Transmart Foundation uh, uh, is focused on right now to make sure that that code base is um, um, going on its evolutionary path appropriately. And uh, more recently in our 1.1 release, which will be on or about September 15th, we're coordinating documentation efforts and we're convening working groups and making sure that the dissemination of that code base is appropriate. Uh, you know, in uh, our Transmart uh, version 1.1, which will be released on September 15th, is undergoing a robust test and will be an elegant system. And the foundation in parallel are setting up four working groups to support the activities of this release and the um, future releases going forward that involve an architecture working group, a content and data working group, IP licensing working group, and users working group. So those of you who are on the call that uh, have interest Interest, we are interested in you. Uh, this slide just shows that uh, this, this actually does work. Here's some of the accomplishments to date that led to the um, migration of the 1.0 to the 1.1 platform. Indicated here are, you know, the different players uh, from academics, industry, and, uh, you know, uh, several of us are linked out to government. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, Thomson Reuters has also contributed modules that are helping our extraction, transloading, uh, transfer, and loading process into Postgres or into Oracle, which is um, still um, um, an option for us. Um, here's a, a picture of uh, the recent meeting in Amsterdam last week and the developers uh, uh, and users that convened in Amsterdam for a three-day meeting to um, focus in on the 1.1 release. 
you know, here are some logos uh, that show the kinds of projects that are being supported by Transmart in Europe, both with eTrix uh, and the IMI indicated on the left, and the CTMM, which is a translational medicine initiative in the Netherlands, which is also um, uh, organizing itself in terms of use uh, against the Transmart platform. Uh, listed here in the next several slides, starting with J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson, which created the Transmart platform in the first place and then spun it out into the community, and Recombinant um, by Deloitte, which supported that effort. And you can see the early adapters here, including uh, Sage and Thomson Reuters and the University of Michigan. And this is by no means a complete list, but it is a good list. And you can see down there in the bottom, the One Mind for Research. You'll be hearing from Stephen Larson today. And, uh, you know, it's uh, growing. And we have uh, now nearly 50 organizations and user spaces across the um, three continents. And the number is growing. And uh, the Transmart Foundation has a website, transmartfoundation.org. And uh, we uh, list upcoming events and uh, coordinate the dissemination and outreach activities through the site. Uh, here are the board of directors of the Transmart Foundation and the operations team. And this is a changing uh, uh, list as we uh, gain, uh, you know, more stability financially and traction in the community. And uh, at this point, uh, we can stop and um, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions and uh, participate in the discussion when it's appropriate. Thank you. Brian, thank you for that introduction to Transmart and demonstrating its applicability across a broad range of organizations involved in medical research and healthcare. If you are just joining our webinar now, welcome. As I mentioned earlier, we will be conducting a Q&A segment following the panelists' presentations. Please type your question for any or all of our panelists into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console, and then hit Submit. Our second panelist, Dr. Siraman Ocharowin, will now begin her presentation. Siraman? Thank you for the introduction, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, this is Siraman Ocharowin, and I'm Manager of Translational Medicine at Thomson Reuters. Today, we would like to present a part of our strategy and involvement in Transmart in order to facilitate Transmart implementation as a translational research platform with an aim to translate knowledge into actionable steps in personal life medicine. Before we go into the details concept of Transmart, first, I would like to show an example where Transmart can be applied in personal life medicine. Here is a figure from a recent review article in Journal of Oncology published this year. The authors identified three requirements for personal life medicine, bioinformatics, tissue banking, and electronic medical records. The data from these three resources can be used in patient stratification, which classifies patients and predicts the outcome of a conventional treatment. A targeted therapy can be then offered to a subset of patients based on their biomarker levels, which in this example is a type of mutation. Transmart presents a novel platform with features that will allow research and implementation in this patient stratification process. So why does Transmart present a significant opportunity in this patient stratification and personal life medicine? Because Transmart allows us to explore correlations between biomarker molecular data and clinical data. An example screenshot here shows the correlation between gene expression level of PI3K signaling pathway genes and time to tumor progression in glioblastoma patients. The Kaplan Mayer plot shows fractions of patients based on their time to tumor progression. The patient can be classified based on their gene expression levels into the blue and red lines. The next screenshot example here shows a box plot of baseline gene signature based on the patient responses to multiple myeloma treatment. We can verify if this gene signature from baseline can be used to classify this patient and predict the treatment outcome. Transmart can also be used as an intermediate analysis step. 
In this example, we generate a list of top differentially expressed genes between two subset of patients based on their residual cancer Bergen response classes. We are then able to run another analysis on these top differentially expressed genes to help researchers extract biological meanings from this result. The bottom right screenshot of enrichment analysis show a list of significant pathways involved in these top differentially expressed genes between the two patient subsets. In addition to correlation between molecular data and clinical data, we are also interested in correlation between different types of molecular data as well. In this example, we did a linear regression analysis between the data from SNPs versus gene expression at microarray. The data come from the myoneurin gene from cancer cell lines. The results show a well-colored plot of copy numbers and expression level, which is consistent to a literature report. Now, in order to achieve those analyses, plus additional advanced analysis, and ultimately a patient stratification model, we need to be able to access and make use of varieties type of data. Similar to what is shown in the first slide, we need to integrate information from clinical trial data, molecular data such as gene expression, SNP, next generation sequencing, or proteomics, electronic health and medical records, and potentially pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and toxicity data from preclinical research. With all the diverse data sets, each data type is traditionally stored within its own data silos with different structure, format, and vocabulary used. We see Transmart as an integrated platform that can tap into each of the data silo and extract knowledge and combine these diverse data sets, therefore enable translational research and provide a step toward personalized medicine. In the next section of my talk, I would like to introduce two issues that could rise uh, from this concept of translational research includes the use of transmart. The first issue is the question of semantic consistency in the data. Although this issue seems inherent when we try to integrate diverse data from different silos, in our experience, it's also an issue with the same data type in the same silo as well. For example, the infamous Mars climate orbiter spacecraft cost NASA $125 million in 1999 due to its uh, inconsistency of the data, which were input in feet and pounds rather than meters and kilograms. In the world of molecular data, the inconsistency can be very complicated. These slides here show different synonyms for MED1 genes and vitamin B2. Several resources can offer different coverage on these synonyms, and it's becoming a big challenge to query and extract information in a consistency manner. Here's another example in data inconsistency. This one is from a clinical terminology that were used to collect patient information. On the top three sources, we can see the different clinical terms were collected for patient breathing status, and we will not be able to easily integrate these data sets from all three resources. A second example on the bottom is the terminology for employment status. Again, the mapping between sources will not be straightforward. The result of this semantic inconsistency issue is that we need a tedious manual curation for the data to be ready to be used in Transmart or any other translational research platform. The general workflow that our team developed over the years, starting with collaboration with J&J and Johnson & Johnson when they developed Transmart, is the first step is we try to identify and obtaining the data. Then we did perform data review in initial QC and reach out for clarification. We interpret the study designs and objectives in order to manage the data and extract the knowledge. Then we organize the data into the Transmart Ready or other appro appropriate format. Then this, then one of the most important steps is we need to apply standard terms and terminology mappings to the data in order to make use of this data from several resources. Then we would perform the data upload 
can do the quality control and make any correction. Once this process is well established, a portion of this can be automated with, with ETL tools in order to scale up and provide regular data update. At the end of this curation process, we achieve semantic consistency by implementing ontologies, data standards, and several data element concepts. In addition, Transmart, we are also providing an easy structured way to interpret the data, so scientists and physicians will be able to make the most use out of the integrated information. The next issue that I would like to talk about today is the issue of big biology data. Why is the big biology data an issue? This biological data, in particular the next generation sequencing, is accumulated exponentially because the sequencing cost is dropping at the rate that's faster than Moore's law. So we have many um, data types available. This slide shows a table from an article in Nature this year showing several namings for different types of OMS data. The established name include commonly used terms such as genome, transcriptome, proteome, and metabolome. The emerging and aspiring ones are very interesting, especially. One of the terms that caught our eyes is integrome, which is a combination of multiple omics data set. With all the big OMS data available, we would expect that we should be able to extract lots of information from them. However, a major bottleneck is actually the data reduction to explain phenotypes, because very little molecular alterations are actually linked to phenotype by executional hypothesis. For example, we could have over 3,000 million base pairs in cancer genome data. On the other hand, however, only three to six mutation driver genes are enough to induce a solid tissue cancer. And even worse, only one mutation of a target kinase gene is sufficient to convey a drug sensitivity result. So what can we do with the big data to extract the information needed for patient stratification applications? The big biological data will need to be funneled through several analysis techniques that will allow us to identify biomarkers for treatment response, disease diagnosis, treatment efficacy monitoring, and other applications in patient stratification. Our approach with Transmart as a tool and platform in this funneling step is to couple Transmart with our knowledge-based analysis technique. Why are we using um, knowledge-based approach? because biological knowledge is the most important big biology, in big biological data analysis. This slide shows a result from MAQC Consortium, which is a large international project with 36 analytical teams from universities, FDA, NIH, pharmaceutical companies, and bioinformatics specialty vendors. All analytical teams were given the same sick data set for cancers and to toxicology. They built models for 13 endpoints, and the models were compared based on accuracy, specificity, and selectivity. General expectation was that there will be one of few gene signature generating models with substantially better performance than other models. However, the result was surprising. The most important factor determining model's performance is the biological of the endpoint. Almost all signatures perform well on positive control, patient genders, or estrogen receptor status in breast cancer. However, all models fail in predicting the more complex endpoints, such as five-year survival in multiple myeloma. Therefore, we need to integrate the prior knowledge approach in order to improve the type of analysis. For example, this diagram shows functional information that can be added from protein interactions combined into the subnetwork approach. The subnetwork can then be used for feature selection and classification of patients. 
Similarly, other knowledge-based approach, including pathway-based activity, has been well established. Patient classifications based on pathway activity consistently achieve better performance than classifiers based on individual gene expression, as shown in several published articles here. Based on our approach, which is a complementary analysis step with transmart features, we are implementing this pathway and network models and classification tools through Transmart. The result will be a translational research platform with classification tools, which will enable us to share the analysis results to disseminate analysis models, to query, test, and validate models, to integrate new type of data sets, to generate and test new hypotheses, and to achieve all other steps in order to reach patient stratification results. Last but not least, we at Thomson Reuters would like to thank the support from the Transmart Foundation. Together with our teams of diverse expertise, we are building an efficient translational resource steps, one building block at a time. So I'm now at the end of my presentation and be happy to answer any questions we have at the end. Thank you, Suraman, for that very detailed discussion of the utility of Transmart in dealing with large amounts of data in numerous studies. Your insights are much appreciated. After the next presentation, we will be conducting a Q&A segment on topics and issues brought up during the webinar. I invite you to type your question for any of all of our panelists into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console, and then hit Submit. Our third speaker is Dr. Stephen Larson, and he's ready to go. Stephen? Thanks, John, and thanks to Brian and Sermon for their presentations uh, prior to this. Um, I'm the Chief Information Officer for One Mind for Research. One Mind for Research is a nonprofit dedicated to accelerating the translation of research into cures. It works across academia, industry, and government. Um, you can find out more about the organization at onemindforresearch.org. We've been talking quite a bit about the challenges of personalized medicine, and we always like to begin the challenges that we see uh, as the analogy to the blind men and the elephant. Um, this is a, a parable where um, a bunch of wise men are trying to understand the, what an elephant is, never having seen it individually, and so one, and they can only experience the elephant via touch. So uh, one might feel that uh, a column, a Greek column, is uh, what it's doing when it's touching the leg. Another might feel that uh, it's got a snake when it's touching the trunk. Another one might feel that it's got a spear when it's touching the tusks. And the challenge that these blind men face is the same one that we feel that we face in, in medicine in general and, and particularly in neuroscience, which is one of the focuses of one line for research, uh, in that there is a challenge in assembling those divergent views together because we have trouble really understanding uh, both the nervous system and the body uh, as a whole. So while medicine has been built on hundreds of years of individual operation uh, observations, um, our approach to understanding it has essentially been sort of linear and lucky, meaning that when we find cures, we are sort of uh, getting a fortuitous uh, understanding rather than one that's based on a principal means of assembling knowledge together. So hope is not a method for progress. Um, what we would like is something that's much more systematic. This is uh, an image that's not dissimilar from what Brian showed you right at the beginning in terms of the idea of a knowledge network. So um, I don't need to reiterate all the pieces, but essentially with a patient in the upper uh, center, uh, the goal for one mind is to have that individual. And I think the goal of the entire healthcare system really is that all individuals live a lifetime free of brain disease and disease in general. Um, and we view a system that would really be facilitating that as going all the way from in the upper left, providing the ability to collect information about ailments and conditions uh, via biosensors and different kinds of omics and imaging platforms. That data then feeding into data collection processes that are able to give us, um, that are able to have a storage facility for all that data so it could be aggregated over time. Um, that done then with data standards and ontologies. Uh, in collaboration with other groups and sectors that uh, house biorepositories, uh, EMRs, in concert with uh, the best academic groups and industry groups. And all that feeding into the center with sort of the idea of the knowledge network that we've been talking about here 
um, where those data get deposited. They can be aggregated with other data. Obviously, uh, this is being done with uh, the utmost care in, in privacy and de-identification, um, but in a means in which those data then can uh, be uh, analyzed with um, the best cutting-edge analysis tools, and that data can be mined. Eventually, we would like to see then those data turn into counterfactuals and simulations. Uh, we see simulations that are done quite often in other areas of engineering and in many other scenarios and many other industries, and hasn't happened as much in biomedical science, and, and having the right data is one of the big uh, impediments to that today. And then moving on to being able to build translational models uh, that we can test, uh, turn that into integrated solutions, and eventually have that come back into the healthcare system with best practices and, and eventually impacting mobile health and educational programs. So that's the context of setting for this knowledge network. And it's, again, it's sort of the same story that we've been talking about. Um, within One Mind for Research, there are uh, various projects. Uh, the one that I head up is called the Apollo Program. We are focused on the following challenges that we see in the landscape. And, and of course, none of this is new, but I think it's always helpful to set some context for what we're working on. So we see the following challenges. We believe that data sharing is poorly incentivized. Uh, we believe that data and tool sharing is not simple enough, and we also believe that data sets are still balkanized and hard to find. And so what I'm going to walk you through here in the next several minutes is uh, an overview of, of sort of what those challenges mean and, and how we've been uh, addressing them under the context of the Apollo program. So um, first of all, data sharing is poorly incentivized. I, I, I really like the slide that Brian showed earlier from the nature cover where it said data, what data, and, and scientists uh, sort of hiding data. Well, why, why do we have that situation? Certainly not because scientists are evil individuals. In fact, uh, they really do work on behalf of the public good. So why is it so hard to get data out of uh, folks? And, and it's not just scientists and academia, but industry as a whole. Uh, well, so we sort of wanted to look at this not just from a question of what technology we can apply, but in fact, what are all of the sociological features that lead to that? And so we think that, uh, you know, typically when you talk about incentives, you talk about the carrot and the stick. Um, and in this case, that's sort of what we see uh, is that, in fact, it's not that the carrot is actually an inviting thing. It's not an incentive, a positive incentive, but it tends to be more that it's a carrot wielding a stick to club people into submission for, for sharing their data. It's sort of like, well, it's an obligation. You must share your data. It's the law. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't tend to make people very eager, and it tends to make people hold out as much as, as much as they can. So really what we've started to think a lot about is what is the value that, get, that a system, both technological and sociological, can provide back to the individual sharing data? What, what can we do to, in fact, motivate people to share data? So that's, that's the challenge that we see there. We don't think, it's, we don't think that's been focused on enough. Secondly, uh, we don't think that data and tool sharing is simple enough. So let's say that you have now a properly motivated and incentivized scientist who's ready to share their data set, but they get on their laptop, they ship a file over to their colleague, and uh, all too often what happens is a lot of pain and frustration because those files are in various formats. The uh, end user may not have the right tool. The end user may not know how the data were described. These are often highly technical, highly detailed uh, data sets that require a lot of interpretation on the other end, and this, this generally causes pain. So this is the kind of challenge that we're really trying to address. And then lastly, data sets are balkanized and hard to find. Um, we think of the, the blind man and the elephant as an exemplar, sort of analogy to this idea that these data sets, in fact, that these individuals are collecting are now digitized, and they are to some extent accessible on the web, and they can be sent around, but they are not in a position to be unified and not in a position to be integrated. So that is another challenge. Also, we face the challenge that no one ever does a Google search like this. Uh, no one ever searches for a data set that they've never heard of that would be most useful uh, to them. And that's a challenge that we, we call a challenge of discovery, challenge of not being able to find data sets that are relevant to one, even one one knows what kind of thing they might be uh, wanting to find. So, um, so those are the, sort of the, the three challenges that we're looking for. And what I'm going to talk to you about now is a case study that we did sort of just as we've uh, been starting up our, our informatics program to kind of see if we can focus on that first thing that we were seeking, which is value. And what value could we create, even if it was for a limited group of people, but in the rust that we were interested in uh, conducting. So One Line for Research has been fostering international collaboration, specifically around uh, traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. Uh, sometimes we're mistaken for an organization that's only focused on those diseases, 
Uh, in fact, that's just a starting point for us. We feel that uh, that uh, TBI and PTSD uh, has been underserved by other organizations, and so it, it has um, it has the feature that we can actually do the greatest good by starting with those. Um, but uh, we, by no means, believe that that's the only those are the only diseases that need to be worked on. In fact, we think that a lot more collaboration could happen between uh, the studies of, of, of different brain diseases uh, collectively. But we started there. And we've also wanted to ensure that what we do in the United States, uh, we're, we're based in Seattle, Washington, is not exclusive to the U.S., and so we've really reached out to Canada and Europe. And so, specifically, um, in, in traumatic brain injury, we've been working to form collaborations between groups uh, in the U.S., uh, c- conducting government-sponsored studies. Um, uh, I'll tell you about Track TBI today. Um, working with uh, government groups like the NINDS and FITBR, a traumatic brain injury collaboration between NIH and the Department of Defense, as well as the Neuroscience Information Framework, uh, a NIH blueprint project for reconciling data in neuroscience. And uh, as well, we've been working on the Europe side with Dr. Andrew Moss, who is the head of the IMPACT study, also a traumatic brain injury study, and and also the Center TBI uh, grant, um, which will be conducted over the next several years, um, which is also focused on collecting data sets about traumatic brain injury, as well as the INCF, the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility. Um, it's an uh, international organization headquartered in Stockholm, Sweden. But today I'll tell you about the TRAC TBI study and so uh, and Dr. Jeff Manley. And so uh, Jeff is um, head of neurosurgery at San Francisco General Hospital, as well as professor of neuroscience at UCSF. And um, the TRAC TBI study which uh, was concluded in terms of all of its data collection at the beginning of um, last year, uh, included 652 subjects uh, with a history of TBI who basically came into the emergency room in in three different states with a head injury. Um, Then they had several different data elements collected about them. Um, So their phenotype was collected. What kind of brain injury did they have? Uh, Images were taken, MR. Uh, blood and serum were drawn and sequenced, um, and then they were tracked over three, six, nine, twelve months across various factors, um, you know, clinical outcome measures uh, of alertness, um, of their of depression. And so, in fact, uh, for those 652 patients, something like 700 different data uh, measures were collected. So it's a fairly interesting data set from the perspective of there's different modalities of data, different uh, data types that need to be brought together. Um, it serves a real purpose in that. Uh, one of the efforts behind this is to um, understand what data elements ought to be collected from um, from patients like this. There's still uh, a lack of uh, hard quantitative evidence to understand how traumatic brain injury um, how, how traumatic brain injury evolves over time as a disease and and how cures to it um, improve the uh, individual patient situation. So uh, Jeff had the following challenge that we uh, saw before, which was. He collected this great data set, and he wanted to collaborate with uh, multiple investigators. But, again, there was a data set that uh, was painful to ship around. So we really started off by wanting to address this this second challenge uh, that we outlined. And uh, so given that we live in the age of the Internet, um, we sought as one mind for research for a solution that would simplify that process. And so we really struck on Transmart as our first organization and to help us work with that. So... Um, Transmart is a software that we feel has several qualities that were would be valuable for us uh, to improve that process of tool sharing. Um, and it's already been mentioned, uh, but uh, the aspects that we are interested in are that it's, uh, it's web-based, it's open source, so there's no vendor lock-in. It enables a graphic user interface for rapid cross-variable analysis. enables data integration, which means that these different modalities of data can be all brought together and analyzed um, is in a single place. Um, it was originally created by J&J and Recombinant Data. That uh, Those uh, two groups have helped to promote it. Um, and now, of course, with the Transmart Consortium, there's a lot of interest and energy and, and really um, the work that Brian Athey is doing with the Transmart Consortium there is, is just so exciting um, that it's uh, it, it really made a lot of sense to try this out and, and jump on board and see what it could do and really put Transmart through its paces. So then we've, we've used Transmart as a focal point for this collaboration. And so in order to do that, we needed to build a sort of public-private partnerships around this. And so 
Here, the Transmart icon in the center is really the Transmart Foundation that, that has been at the core of this collaboration. Um, but in addition, we brought many different groups together. This is one of the things that, that One Line for Research really does is, is trying not to invent the wheel and trying to have other partners help us. So from question systems uh, that originally collected the data set, they're really a really great organization for um, for uh, electronic uh, clinical research forms, and, and they really helped Jeff launch Track TBI. Uh, Thomson Reuters was instrumental in helping us curate that data set and really get it into Transmart, so their knowledge of Transmart was really critical. Uh, Johnson Johnson, who helped uh, with Recombinant by Deloitte, uh, build the system, were also very useful for technical details. So what we did is we put this Transmart instance up in the cloud. So we used Amazon Web Services to host it. And then, um, and then we brought that whole data set up into Transmart to see what, uh, what it meant to really work with that data set. So uh, what, uh, what did we create from that? Well, here are the takeaways. So we loaded that instance up on the cloud. Um, we, we uploaded and, and transformed that data set into uh, the Transmart, um, you know, into the Transmart format. And that then allowed us to run many key analyses, again, across these different data types. And actually, we've, we've hosted several scientific sessions around this where different scientists have been able to ask questions like, what are the risk factors that a, a patient has to not showing up for, you know, a six or nine or 12 month, uh, follow up? Things that would be helpful for us to understand, uh, how to run future studies, as well as basic medical questions about the conditions, the, the level of improvement depending on uh, the, the patient's demographic background, the level of improvement based on different treatments. All these questions are things that now we're actively asking around the Transmart system and um, have been very um, have been very helpful. It's certainly much better than shipping data sets around and having individuals uh, try to deal with those data sets individually. So now uh, there's been a greater focus on even deeper analyses. Now that uh, those questions have come up, uh, the, the researchers uh, now very rapidly find new questions that they want to ask to dig in further. And so um, we've been running training sessions to help those uh, in individuals be able to run with Transmart on their own and, uh, and ask their questions immediately. So we really tried to change the game from shipping data around to providing a login to a system that enables analysis immediately is really what people want is they want solutions uh, to their questions, not, uh, you know, uh, some, an attachment. They don't want an email attachment. That's really not the, the end goal here. So then uh, just real briefly, this has then been, uh, this has got us thinking about how to go beyond uh, you know, just this, because uh, Transmart we really do as a building block. It's a critical core component, um, but there are many other exciting tools that are out there in, in the space that's helping folks understand uh, more about biomedical data. So we have a vision for what we're currently calling One Mind Portal under the Apollo Project. And here we really want to think about those other aspects of the challenge that we haven't, um, that, that we to some extent started to address. We started to see some incentivization happening around folks seeing the power of being able to collaborate around digital tools uh, with a track TBI one data set. And we want to see how can we expand that further. I really think that one of the things that gets left out of the incentivization chain is um, the uh, ability to connect people online. Um, so we really feel that we want patients and clinicians and researchers, as well as patient advocacy groups like, say, the Michael J. Fox Foundation and technology partners like different uh, software companies that are in the, the biopharma space, so I'll be able to uh, talk to each other and to be able to find out what's going on uh, beyond just a sort of serendipitous way that folks bump into each other, say, at a, at a, at a given trade show or conference. Um, so we've really thought about uh, three components that build on top of what we've shown you already, and I, and I can only walk you through just the very beginnings of, of the ideas of this, um, but you can find out more at onemindforresearch.org. So um, we plan to have a social network for the One Mind portal that adds a social layer on top of some of the technologies we've, um, we've been talking about already. Um, we really think that the carrot uh, and the stick model we really want to provide is something more like this, where folks share data and provide value back to them. So the value we'd like to provide is that if folks come onto the system, they should be able to discover people uh, relevant to their interests. They should be able to find new tools that they can use automatically online through their web browser. They should be able to find data sets that they can just click on to, to apply for access or to get access directly in the case of public data sets, to be able to use uh, those tools to ask analysis questions like we've seen with Transmart, but do that with, with a variety of uh, tools and, and great products that are out there, um, and also then be able to share uh, discoveries that people make with those uh, things. So this is really kind of taking what we've seen as explosive growth around uh, tools like, um, well, 
around platforms like uh, Facebook and, and Google+, Plus, where there's really a very low barrier to sharing things like baby pictures, um, but apply that to the biomedical space and uh, allow the collaboration to happen around different kind of data than just pictures that you take on your phone, make that data be biomedical data that's relevant uh, to the, all those different actors that we just talked about. Um, and secondly, we plan to have a data and app marketplace so that um, what we got started with Transmart, putting Transmart in the middle of the cloud, uh, really becomes a, a holding place for many different tools and systems to come together and uh, be able to be shared. So what we're thinking about with this marketplace is think of sort of the iTunes store on your phone or your smartphone, um, or for those of you familiar with the Chrome Web Store, there it's a platform where many different applications are um, you, you can see them, and, and installing them allows you to integrate with those uh, tools and systems in a deeper way so that you have them all in one place. And in addition, uh, it, that enables you to, to have social components, like understanding who in your network is using a given tool or who in your network is using a given data set, things which we believe will help to incentivize folks to share data and use tools. And finally, a data warehouse, which addresses the challenge that we see which is a bit more of the techie challenge um, of how do you take tools and data sets and turn them into Lego building blocks. I think we've seen some analogies of this already. Um, we view that as a challenge uh, of, of taking those different parts and reusing them and turning them into synthetic holes that address, you know, in the top right there, uh, you know, the healthcare system, and in the bottom right, um, how do we better have synthetic understanding of the brain and nervous system. Um, and, and, and the techie challenge there is one of matching together different uh, heterogeneous ID systems into a single sort of single universal barcode that uh, doesn't replace what's there currently out in the landscape, but which allows mapping of data sets together. Um, and again, you can find out more about that at onemindforresearch.org. So in summary, what we've started with is a set of challenges, and we've, we've seen uh, this case study that we performed with Transmart as really being instrumental to then pointing the direction for where we want to go. Uh, we're working with many additional partners as we ramp up for this uh, portal milestone um, that involves these three components that I just I just mentioned to you before: a sort of social network, data app marketplace, and a, and a data warehouse. So um, we've really kind of closed the loop here, um, going all the way from challenges, looking at that case study, and then describing the portal vision. So I'll stop here and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, Saruman, and Stephen, for your highly informative presentations on the Transmart Knowledge Management Platform. Our audience definitely appreciated your talks, and they've sent in some very pertinent questions. But before your moderator, John Sterling, begins our Q&A session, I'd like to ask you to disable your pop-up blockers, because a short survey on this webinar will be appearing shortly. We would very much appreciate your feedback on this webinar, and your thoughts will help us to continue to bring you topical and timely webinars in the future. Thank you. Okay, so we have a number of very interesting and pertinent questions. And the first one, Brian, is going to be for you. How do we, how do we reach out for potential collaboration with Transmart? Well, you know, uh, the, it's, a, it's a good question. It's a broad question. Um, uh, I think the best way is to get involved with the Transmart community um, updates that are now occurring monthly. We've got one, uh, and we'll post it up on the website, transmartfoundation.org. Tuesday uh, of next week, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, uh, there's an open Transmart community uh, phone call, and we're going to be doing these now monthly. And uh, I will forward the information up and make sure it's on the website, but that, I think, is an excellent way to um, uh, find out what's happening and identify collaborations. And, uh, and another way is to get involved with the Transmart Foundation working groups, which are just being now launched through that mechanism of community engagement through those calls. So I think that's one good way to do it. That was very clear. Thank you. Another question, Brian. What is the granularity of clinical data in Transmart? Well, that really does vary. Um, you know, one thing that we're learning about is that Transmart is a platform that has a collection of instances. So, for example, in the ETRIX project in Europe, uh, they're um, currently loading 
35 clinical and translational projects into um, Transmart four at a time, uh, you know, throughout the period of the IMI funding over five years. And, um, uh, you know, and some of those will um, allow access out to the outside. Uh, another thing that's happening right now is that British Telecom, BT Global, is talking to the Transmart Foundation about offering access to 60 million electronic health records uh, um, 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 elements uh, coming from the um, IHS uh, the Health Service uh, from the UK. These would be de-identified, anonymized and would have longitudinal data from two to eight years. And so um, as time goes on, there'll be more and more resources like that. Another one is the BioNimbus Cloud being led by Robert Grossman at the University of Chicago and TCAG, TCGA data, 1,000 genomes, much of NCBI data will be, mail, be made available through that mechanism into the Transmart um, platform. Uh, you still have to work with dbGaP and NIH to get permission to some of those data resources, but 1,000 genomes is ready to go. And, um, and so over time, there will be many more uh, opportunities over the next uh, several months, next few years. Uh, we'll be learning more and more about um, uh, data at high granularity that will be available through the Transmart uh, Foundation and Transmart platform. Now, here's a question from a group of students who are very interested in Transmart. Uh, Brian, what's an example of how MD, PhD students could use Transmart in their dissertation for translational research? Well, there's several ways. One is that um, translational research, just like I showed in the one slide from the National Academy on precision medicine, uh, involves bringing together, you know, molecular data with patient data, you know, in a way that... Um, can allow for um, uh, uh, analysis, just like Sherman showed in her talk, I thought, with several great examples. And so it could be used as a platform. But another thing that um, we're interested in doing is um, uh, evaluating the effectiveness of Transmart with respect to, uh, you know, other platforms that are out there. And so an MD, PhD student wouldn't make a thesis out of evaluation of platforms, but should uh, have as part of their thesis comparing the effectiveness of various platforms. And um, one thing that the Transmart um, uh, community is all about is sharing and uh, openness and transparency. And uh, one of the things that students should consider is that um, participating in the Transmart community uh, is a way to connect with others and to uh, accelerate how fast we learn and how fast we can um, actually, uh, you know, develop new ways of doing analysis and understanding. Okay. And, Brian, has metabolomic correlation to gene variant data been correlated to the system? Not yet, but I'll tell you it's something that we're very interested in. Uh, we've got a, a, a pilot project with Dr. Chuck Barant at the University of Michigan, who's our leader of the metabolomics uh, enterprise here, and who has one of three NIDDK metabolomics core, NIH metabolomics core initiatives. And we participate closely with the National Data Coordinating Center for Metabolomics Data, uh, which is at the University of California, San Diego, led by Shanker Supermamian and the um, San Diego Supercomputing Center. And um, one of the projects, pilot projects in that area, is doing this correlation. And I'm sure siriman has got some specific examples, but at the infrastructure and data level, we're trying to partner with the San Diego group and the set of cores, one of which we run here, to allow for um, um, global access to the NIH-produced data that uh, is just coming online. And they're bringing five, or sorry, three more uh, metabolomics, regional metabolomics cores online next year. So it would be six uh, cores that would be feeding data into the data coordinating center, and Transmart will be linking to that um, data coordinating center resource space. Okay, Brian, here's a question from a member of a group. Uh, we're currently evaluating Transmart pros PostgreSQL on Linux. I would like to know of your, of your plans for ETL and data importation to the Postgres PostgreSQL system. Currently, it's not easy, and there's not much documentation posted. Can you take that one? 
We, we understand that. Um, you know, we've been working for over a year to uh, migrate uh, uh, the um, database capability to the open source Postgres in Transmart. It's been a long haul. The Johnson & Johnson Corporation, University of College, uh, uh, Imperial College London, University of Michigan, Recombinant Data Corporation, and several others have participated in this. September 15th on the 1.1 release, we will be releasing the Postgres version of Transmart out in the community with significant documentation so that it can be used. Uh, you know, and uh, in terms of ETL, I think uh, Zeriman is aware that Thomson Reuters has provided ETL modules, which are now being tested against um, Postgres and have actually been used by Thomson Reuters and others, and certainly by Imperial in Michigan, to, um, you know, enhance the ETL uh, extraction, transfer, and loading process and make it more streamlined and doable. Uh, it'll take time to get this all to work, but the plan is to release that, um, that code into the, um, into the um, uh, source code in the 1.1 version and the documentation so it could be used September 15, 2013. Okay, and on we go, Brian. To what extent can Transmart generate hypotheses for neuroscience? For example, will the software offer hypothetical seeds for the user to develop? Well, this is early days. Uh, as Stephen Larson has indicated, um, One Mind for Research, which is a uh, not-for-profit public-private partnership, in neuroscience research, largely focused now in traumatic brain injury and, uh, and post-traumatic stress disorder, is beginning to um, utilize Transmart to be a hypothesis generation engine for um, neuroscience um, kind of narrowly. But the vision that the One Mind for Research group has is much broader than that. They've been working with Sean Hill, which is who is the leader of the INCF brain project in um, Europe. They've been working with the folks over at the Allen Brain Institute, and um, they've been working with Husseini Manji, uh, who's the leader of the neuroscience R&D effort at the Johnson & Johnson Corporation, and others to create such an environment so that um, a hypothesis generation capability, which is, I think, uh, will, in the end of the day, be a key feature of the Transmart platform. It's... Um, it's uh, it's a discovery platform after all, and uh, it's a way to actually do hypothesis generation and bring the data together to validate the hypotheses that are generated. And so in communities like neuroscience and other communities, we expect to see this over time develop um, quite robustly. It's early days, but I think it's um, uh, a promising uh, uh, feature of the platform as we develop it. Sir so, Miley, uh, we think that's a real important question. We'd like you to either add to that or give your own perspective, so let me read it again. Uh, to what extent can Transmart generate hypotheses for neuroscience? For example, will the software offer hypothetical seeds for the user to develop? So, yes, this is the exact um, question that we were looking for uh, with one my uh, for research in this uh, traumatic brain injury case study. Um, we, we do realize that we need additional workflow in terms of the um, analysis and hypothesis generation to be able to decouple uh, a testing population versus a validation population. And so that's the direction that Transmart Foundation and our, all of our collaborators are looking forward to working with that. And Sriman, in the traumatic brain injury study, was patient genotype information included? Yes, in this specific example that Dr. Larson presents, uh, we have five um, genotypic uh, information from the patient, so five, five genes, and we also have several um, protein biomarkers available as well. And in addition to that, when my four research also collaborating with others um, clinical trial in, in this area, and they also have various type of genotype and proteomic data available. Well, thank you so much for answering that. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but please note that this webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genengnews.com.
If you miss parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to your colleagues and friends. I want to say thanks again to the panel for the outstanding presentations, and also want to say thank you to our audience for your attention and for your very thoughtful questions about the various topics brought up during the webinar. And thank you to our sponsor, Thomson Reuters, who made this event possible. Bye for now.